you. <clears throat> it's great to be here. In case you haven't noticed, it is very chic in many academic circles nowadays to be a Darwinian. Because of the work of E.O. Wilson and many other public scientists, Darwinian evolution has become perhaps the leading meta-narrative of our day, and many people now default to it as the best explanation of our origins, our end, and everything in between. The story it tells is seductively simple. Life began at the molecular level, and over billions of years and trillions of mutations, conditions amenable to human consciousness emerged, and with them, Homo sapiens sapiens, the most highly evolved and complex beings on the planet. Proponents of this meta narrative <clears throat> believe that all that remains for us to do is to explain how consciousness emerged and to theorize about its evolutionary purpose. A growing number of public scientists and intellectuals are taking every opportunity to prove the viability of this story. A good example of this effort can be found in Antonio Damasio's recent book, Self Comes to Mind. Damasio argues that the Darwinian evolutionary framework allows neurobiology to explore how the brain just developed that, quote, something extra, the protagonist we carry around and call self, or me, or I. At some point along the way, his story goes, self-consciousness was just produced by the brain as it became better and better at responding to its environment. This is the same thing, by the way, that Daniel Dennett argues in his book that has the stunning title, Consciousness Explained. These are just two examples of many narratives told by scientific naturalists to ensure that we see everything in human culture, from art to ethics to religion, as simply the product of brute human desire for meaning and for order. Now, I'm not trying to make any kind of argument about the possibility of evolution being the means by which God created the universe. What I am saying here is that, in a way, the ascendancy of this Darwinian paradigm has provided a useful simplicity for us, because there can be no doubt that this account clashes emphatically with the Christian account of human experience. For regardless of one's position on the mechanism of human evolution, all Christians agree that God is a transcendent personal being who created human beings in his image with a purpose. Simply put, human beings are not biological accidents. We are part of an overall design. Indeed, for Christians, the fact that God purposefully created human beings explains nearly everything about us, including the fact that we cannot be thoroughly explained. Now, I lay these accounts side by side so simply in order to argue the following. That one of these accounts, the Christian account, explains far better than does the other the ancient insight of Aristotle that man is by nature a storytelling animal who takes pleasure in imitation. I believe that story, as we conceive of it in the Western world today, inherently resists scientific naturalist accounts of human experience. In this resistance, story has a dimension to it that can be described as theological. And with this dimension, story, I think, has the inherent power, regardless of authorial intent, to activate the part of the reader's imagination that is bent on the search for the transcendent. To put it another way, our appreciation of and our insatiable appetite for story reveals that we long for a meaningful existence and end and that the most logical explanation for this longing is that our lives are in reality tales told, stories ordered toward a meaningful and beautiful telos. Now the reasons for this are manifold and I don't have time to explain them all, but I would like today to consider storytelling and story reading as an affair of the mystery of personal consciousness. Not a singular authorial consciousness alone, but necessarily a constellation of consciousnesses, all of which are inherently personal, embodied, I will argue, and irreducibly particular. I think it is more precise to call art, and especially story, a relationship between conscious presences. In other words, for any story to exist, much less to have meaning, conscious presences must be interacting with each other. There is always, in every story, an I and a thou, and in another thing, usually another a, a thou, for the I and the thou to be 
focused on. So you can see from this chart that this is a simplified version of what Walker Percy called the delta factor. This image, of course, does not depict all of the relations involved in storytelling. But these are the most basic relations, for without these three things, the I and the thou and the story, the story doesn't exist. A glance at this chart reveals that at the very least, storytelling suggests the Trinity. And its highest consideration, the Trinity, which is an affair of love between persons, best explains the story as well. Now, to snatch this audacious idea of mine from the realm of abstraction, which is not where it belongs, I will make my case through a famous story attributed to a writer not known for his theological commitments, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Hemingway, also not known for mincing words, apparently made a wager with a fellow writer, with a group of fellow writers. Place 10 bucks on the table if you think that I cannot write a six-word short story. They did, and he did, and he won the bet. And this is what he came up with. For sale, baby shoes never worn. Now nobody knows for certain if this anecdote about the bet is true or not. But if you've ever tried to write a six-word story or any story at all, you will immediately understand how brilliant this story is. It demonstrates what Hemingway thought about story writing, that it should work like an iceberg, with only one-eighth of it being visible above water, and the rest of it, well, you know, going on to sink the Titanic. <laughs> Even in this simple story, what is moving and being moved is very large and powerful. What's moving and being moved is the rest of the story a story about persons whose presence has meaning, a story that is worth being told. To write well is to know and to demonstrate that there is always something beyond that which is seen and that which can or should be completely told or completely explained. Now in this essential observation, Hemingway shows a logical affinity with the theological approach of the Christian personalists. The way that Emmanuel Mounier put it, is that scientific analysis can never be the whole story about humanity because scientific analysis is about, is, is about explaining. And to explain is, by definition, to let go of the singular, of that which is one and indivisible. The person is not something that one can find at the end of an analysis, nor is it a definable combination of characteristics. If it were a sum total, the items could be listed. But this is the reality whose contents cannot be put into an inventory. Now, Hemingway wouldn't necessarily agree with Mounier altogether, of course. But his iceberg theory suggests that a story cannot and should not ever explain human persons. It should never let go of the singular, because the singular is its lifeblood. Story is not primarily about defining characteristics, explaining behavior, or predicting action. It is about experiencing the mystery of other lives, other experiences. By its nature, a story insists that we cannot be inventoried. So let's go back to the story for a moment. Here I find it useful to borrow a term from narratology called focalization. In this particular short story, the primary author or focalizer, the agent doing the seeing, is Hemingway, who selects the ad. The secondary author, often called the implied author, is also a focalizer. He or she is the imagined classified ad writer, whose situation it is we have been led to contemplate. He or she or they have probably lost a baby in a tragic accident, but that of course is not known either, right? After all, the baby shoes in question could have just been a lousy shower gift like that diamond-studded baby tiara that Skylar got in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Or the seller could be someone who just acquired the shoes by stealing them. Or maybe their baby just never had the chance to wear the shoes and so on, right? But the power of the story comes from the fact that although we don't know the rest of the story, we know that there is one. There are also at least two sets of audiences for the story. The first audience is the imagined reader of the classified ads. Classified ads, of course, have no meaning without the people who go to the ads to look for something to purchase. The second audience of the story is us, the readers of this particular classified ad, which again only makes sense to us as a story once we imagine the entire set of relationships that it describes. We are left with the bare bones of a narration and a lot of questions, 
all of them irreducibly personal and irreducibly particular to the actors in this story. Think about it. Whose baby? What happened to the baby? What does the putting up of the shoes for sale say about the people involved? And so on. And these are just the questions we might ask about the content of the story. They don't even begin to scratch the surface of the kinds of questions we ask ourselves when we hear such a story. Why am I so drawn in? Why do I want to know what happened? Why do I feel even perhaps a deep sadness, even when I know the story has been invented and I have no idea necessarily what it's about? If you put all these questions together, it begins to become clear that what story does at its most basic level is activate a constellation of conscious and embodied presences, presences that we call persons. The energy produced by the story is increased by the iceberg factor, by the unrevealed aspects of the connections between these presences, each with their own histories, memories, and experiences. And just as a side note here regarding the energy produced by even the shortest of sh stories, Another personal favorite of mine is a story by Lydia Davis called Tropical Storm. And here is the entire story. Like a tropical storm, I too may one day become better organized. It's a good story. <laughs> Since I don't have time to discuss all the presences involved in storytelling, I will focus the remainder of my rem remarks today on one of the most contested of presences, the presence of the author. Now, I have three points I would like to make about authorial presence. Authorial presence is, first of all, a first-person consciousness. Second, it is an embodied consciousness that relies on the particular and irreplaceable bodies of others. And finally, to draw on the Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin, authorial presence is a consummating consciousness, which here includes the idea of seeing a person from the outside. I will take each of these aspects in turn. First, first-person consciousness. When Michel Foucault and Roland Barthes and others declared the death of the author, it was to emphasize the danger of freezing the meaning of a given text into a singular one, the authorial intent. But the reduction of the author to author function for the sake of resisting this imposed unity has had an odd effect of making us forget that at the most basic level, any given story originated somewhere within someone's consciousness. That we do not know whose consciousness it was, for instance, was it really Hemingway, was it really Shakespeare, does not change the fact that it was spoken or written by a person or persons, not found in the stars or on a monkey's keyboard. The authorial presence is in this way a first person consciousness. Think about it, it is aware of itself. And specifically, it is aware of itself as an indexical consciousness in that it points to something for us to see. Hemingway points to this classified ad, which itself points back through the classified ad, first person consciousness, to the story of the baby. Some of the most interesting work being done on the concept of first person consciousness has been in reply to the account of human experience I opened up talking about, scientific naturalism, the account insisted upon by Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, and the like. Philosophers like Nancy Baker fight against these reductive accounts of human persons by first demonstrating that first-person consciousness exists as an ontological reality, and then arguing if that is the case, it cannot be true that the universe is inherently impersonal, which also then proves that scientific naturalism cannot be true. Now, I'm reducing a very complex argument to a sentence. But the gist of it is to say that first-person consciousness, without which story itself would not be possible, is simply not so easily explained away as a little extra something that's been produced by the brain, as Damasio and Dennett would have us believe. It is actually more logical to see it as the gift of a personal creator. Second, irreducible particularity, the second aspect. To talk about first-person consciousness this much runs the risk of implying that consciousness is the only thing that matters and not its embodiment. But this is precisely not the case in storytelling. The way that stories actually work most of the time today is one of the proofs that authorial consciousness must be an embodied consciousness. 
an author, that is, has an at least partially closed relationship to the object of the storytelling, which I think is the irreplaceable particularity of this given text as a product of his or her imagination in a certain point of time. Consider again our particular story, the story of the baby shoes. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. The arrangement of these words in this way is singular. These six words in this order and with this exact punctuation can be reiterated, of course, even with different meanings, but the singularity of these words arranged this way still remains. And it is, in fact, the condition for the possibility of their repetition in a way that would be recognizable as repetition. This simple fact is, of course, recognized by our legal system, which will enable the Flannery O'Connor estate, for example, to sue you if you take a phrase from her work and use it without attribution. That our legal system can even attempt to do this with a single word, do you recall the recent absurdity of trying to copyright the word three-peat? Says a lot, all right? When we recognize that someone somewhere, probably Hemingway, said or wrote, for sale, baby shoes, never worn, we recognize it as a given utterance that originated somewhere. For you theorists out there, it's parole, not long. Its origin may not be traceable, but that fact does not erase its origin altogether. I will go one step further. For a story to become a story and not just a series of words, abstraction must give way to concrete particularity, and a particularity that I might add is personal. The object of the story, <clears throat> which in this case is the protagonist or hero, probably the parents of the baby, even though they are not real, they cannot be considered abstractly. Also, stepping into a particular story reifies the particular stepper, at least in relation to this story. This becoming particular in a story can even be seen in the famous animated film, The Dot and the Line, a romance in lower mathematics. Now, this is only the static image. You can go on and see the film yourself. In the movie, the line and the dot begin to interact. And this film proves very simply that when put into the context of a story, which at minimum means something happens to someone in time, the dot and the line cease to be mathematical abstractions and become personal and particular, even with the sound turned off. Of course, they fall in love because that's what opposites do, right? That, of course, is the essence of personification. And when the dot and the line become animatedly personal and particular, we also have a personal and particular re reaction to them. Third and most important point I want to make about the nature of authorial presence in a text is that it is a consummating consciousness. That term comes from Bakhtin. It points to the fact that for an aesthetic event to occur, particularly if that event is a narrative, there needs to be an authorial consciousness that is clearly distinct from the consciousness of the hero. If there is only one consciousness, there can be no aesthetic event. An aesthetic consummation occurs when the author describes and empathizes with an other who is not himself and then inframes the other from the outside. For Bakhtin, we cannot even see ourselves in a mirror. What we see instead is raw material of ourselves without an author. This proves for Bakhtin that we need the eyes of the other on us, which is what the work of art always already suggests. Bakhtin says this, in this sense, one can speak of human, a human being's absolute need for the other, for the other seeing, remembering, gathering, and unifying self-activity, the only self-activity capable of producing his outwardly finished personality. This outward personality could not exist if the other did not create it. Aesthetic memory is productive. It gives birth for the first time to the outward human being on a new plane of being. And the new plane of being, of course, is the work of art. This outside presence is a prerequisite for aesthetic vision. And since choice is involved in considering where aesthetic attention should be given, value is necessarily ascribed to the thing represented. At the very least, the author is saying, look at this. This thing that I'm pointing out to you, it has value. It has value enough for me to bother to represent it to you. Now, it's my contention when that thing of value is another person, which it almost invariably is in some way in storytelling, the act of storytelling is best described as theological. 
This is mostly because selecting a person's story for others to pay attention to, to empathize with, and engage with makes more sense in an inherently personal universe made by a loving God. Part of the reason why this is so is that storytelling does not depend upon the author or the characters being in any way good or the story being used in any particular way. Storytelling really depends only on love. And here Bakhtin is great, for it is upon the given character, he says, even the bad one, that my interested attention is riveted in aesthetic seeing and everything that constitutes the best with respect to content is disposed around him, the bad one, as around the one who, in spite of everything, is the sole center of values. In aesthetic seeing, here's the kicker point here, you love a human being not because he is good, but rather a human being is good because you love him. This is a powerfully theological idea. And here we would do well to remember that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference, all right? So everything I'm trying to say can be boiled down to this. <clears throat> Story writers can be radical, metafictional, narcissistic, experimental, ultramodern, hyperreal, historical, didactic, dogmatic, speculative, moral, and immoral. They can even be sadistic and masochistic. What they cannot be is indifferent. I'm not trying to prove the existence of God by describing the inherently personal nature of story. What I'm trying to argue is that naturalist accounts of human experience clearly come up short in the arena of the narrative arts, which depend on their very existence on value-affirming personal relationships. We can no more give ourselves value and meaning than we can give birth to ourselves. The authorial presence can thus be seen as engaging with and imitating not God as creator, but God when he declares and affirms that his creation is good. I think the difference there is very, very important. So, identifying these three aspects of authorial presence, the first person consciousness, irreducible particularity, and the consummating outside presence, helps to confirm that modern and late modern story still has this creation affirming impulse in its DNA if you will. The novel as a genre, just to give a stunning example, refuses to engage with persons algebraically as if time does not exist and one person can be exchanged for another. Exceptions such as metafiction are exceptions that prove the rule. The pang of recognition we feel in novels as well as in the simple six word story I've been talking about today shows that the most natural human response to life is to view it as a gift. Now my radical conclusion is that perhaps this is true simply because life actually is a gift and that we experience the value and meaning of this gift often dozen of times a day in the stories that we share with one another. <laughs>